Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Engineering Dynamics. In this video, we will be talking about the generalized coordinates with combination of the principle of virtual work. So let's jump right in. Generalized coordinates, also called a minimal set of degrees of freedom. Let's look at our pendulum. So we of course have position X and Y that our body can take. But the problem is that X and Y are not independent. I can choose a random X and I can choose a random Y. They always have to be in some relation to each other because we have our constraint that tells us that X squared plus Y squared equals L squared. So L squared. And thus we can choose X and Y arbitrarily. If we are in 2D and we're talking about point masses, we have two times N degrees of freedom for each point but we have to subtract the uh, constraints that we're given. For example, this one and this, and then we are left with the numbers of degrees of freedom that our system actually has. So in our case with the pendulum, we have two times one body because we have one point in our pendulum and we have one constraint that is given right here. So we're left with only one degree of freedom. So there is something for, in our case, the angle that is our generalized coordinate. So we only have to change the angle in a arbitrary way. We can change the angle in uh, completely randomly and we do not have to think about X and Y's anymore because the angle can be varied independently of anything else. So when we are given the angle, we can clearly find the configuration of our system. If we're only given X, we don't know the configuration because if the X could be like this or like that, if this is our axis one, it could be either like this or like that. And the same is of course true for Y. So if we do X and Y, we have to know both. But for us, we are only left with theta because theta is the only thing we need to know to clearly specify the configuration of our system. And the important thing is that of course, Theta can be varied independently. So if we have multiple uh, degrees of freedom, we can still vary theta in a random way and do not think about the um, degrees of freedom of or the other generalized coordinates. So we call the generalized coordinates Q and in our case, this is theta. And now we can express our positions depending on our Qs. So U, okay, U, okay is now not like X and Y, but some position dependent on our cues. So the virtual displacement that we are actually going for is our positions, UIK. So DUIK divided by DQS. So our QS is in our case, just theta, so our possible uh, so our generalized coordinates times delta, delta QS and D U I K D Q S is our displacement direction. So let's look at a example because this might be a bit confusing, but the most important part you have to remember is that we only need the generalized coordinates to describe a system fully. Let's look at a example. So here we have again our position one and two. They are both a function of theta. That's what we want. And now we vary the positions by deriving it with our Qs times delta Q. In our case, it should be with a S, but we only have one, so we can just get rid of the S's. So position one derived by theta, we're left with this one. Position two derived by theta, we get, we get this one. So now we actually know our direction our particle could move to. Because in the last two videos, we only thought about, or basically we used the fact that we know that point is moving on a tangent, but we have, if we have a difficult or a more complex system, we can't know exactly where the particle is, mo is moving to. But by deriving our positions that only depend on our cues, so our um, generalized coordinates, we automatically get the direction of possible displacement. 
We do all the things we did before. We derive our positions once and twice. For position one, we derived our position two once and twice, and we get, of course, the same equation that we had before. Putting it all in into our equations, we again get the same one, but now it's multiplied with d theta. We can get rid of our constants, and we know that it has to be true for every possible displacement that our theta uh, undergoes. We are left with this equation. This and that cancels out. Sine squared and cosine squared become one. So we have this one left, nothing here, and g times sine. So we are left with L theta double dot times g sine theta. The exact equation that we had before. So we were right. By doing it like this, we can get the equations of motion. But now we don't have to know where our system is moving. We get it by deriving the positions with q theta. But let's look at a example where we have two bodies. So we have two bodies and we have two constraints. The first one is that this length has to stay constant and the h has to stay constant. So if two times two, because we have two body, bodies minus two constraints, we are left with two degrees of freedom. In our case, we have alpha and beta. So these are our cues. And now we have to get our virtual displacement. So we get the position depending on Q, derive it by the QS, multiply them times delta QS, and we have the displacements. And again, we have this is our position of particle K in direction I. Putting it all into our equation of, uh, into our principle of virtual work, here we have the dynamic equilibrium in every direction of every point mass times our displacement. So putting, or the other way around, putting that one into here, we get this equation. So we have the sum over all bodies, the sum over each direction. We have our dynamic equilibrium. We have our possible displacement. And this is, of course, then the sum over all possible cues. But the most important part is that our QS can be varied independently. So if I change, for example, in this example, I can ch change alpha and can change beta, and I don't have to think about what the other's degree of freedom are doing. So if I have a system that looks like this, I can change alpha like, uh, like this, I can change alpha. But if I change alpha, I can still keep beta at a constant or at the same angle. So the most important part to understand here is that our dqs, delta qs, do not have to be considered explicitly because this must be true for every possible delta qs because our degrees of freedom can be varied independently. So it must be true for every delta qs. What we get from that is this equation. So we have again here our dynamic equilibrium. These are our these are our possible displacements, displacement direction, and it has to be valid for every s. So we got rid of this sum and we just put it here. So now we have just a sum over all bodies, a sum over all direction, our dynamic equilibrium, and the possible virtual displacements. You can call this, so xik times duik times dqs as the generalized force and call it q and the rest multiplied with du dqs is called the generalized inertia. I hope this video gave you a small understanding on how we are working with generalized coordinates and what we can do with them to first of all get the displacements direction if we don't actually know how the system is moving and then that or of course, again, remove the reaction forces because they do not participate in the displacements. If we project the equations of motion into the space of the directions compatible with the constraint, and we are left with this equation where we have the mass, the force, the possible displacements, depending on Q that we derived for every possible variation of our uh, Qs. 
So I hope this video gave you a small introduction on how we are working with generalized coordinates. If you have any questions regarding uh, other topics, uh, put them down in the comments. I will do my best to make videos about them as fast as possible. If you are interested in this specific topic, generalized coordinates, you can check out other videos on my channel. I will have examples up very soon. Thank you very much and see you next time.